A wise man once said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends ever towards justice. And during the 1960s in the United States of America, many individuals and organizations worked together to bend that arc even closer towards justice, to correct the wrongs of the past, and to dismantle systemic and social resistance that stood in the way of equality for all. So that struggle still continues today in the United States and beyond. So I think it's more important now, more so than ever, to reflect on the sweat, tears, bravery, and creativity that so many people contributed to the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. This game is the story of that movement. This is free at last, and you're watching What Does That Piece Do? Hey everyone, my name is Joe Byer. Once again, welcome to What Does That Piece Do? Today I'm going to be taking you through Free At Last. So this is a game that was designed by Ted Torgerson and Damon Stone, released on Deets Foundation Games in 2022 as a Kickstarter. This is a two to six player co-op game, but it can also be played competitively. There's a couple different modes. There's a campaign mode and scenario mode as well. Uh, what I'll be showing you though specifically is how to play the two to four player game with specific factions and the examples I'll be using specifically a three player game just to give you an idea of how it works. Elephant in the room though, let's talk about the fact that this game when it was released, the rule book really left something to be desired. It was a lacking a lot of info and clarity and I think it uh, really you know, reflected poorly on the game which I think is actually a great game. I've been in touch with one of the designers getting a lot of clarity on the rules so I can make this video and you wouldn't be seeing this video if I didn't think that there was a game here that could actually be played and enjoyed in a very enlightening and engaging experience too. So that said, it's going to be a couple of liberties I'll be taking here in the uh, tutorial. I'm not going to be showing you the board much and I'll get to why a little bit later. Um, I'll give some further feedback on the game, you know, what can make maybe make it better and improve it a little bit uh, if there's ever going to be a second uh, edition or second printing, um, but I'll dive into the history probably in a later video. So I will say if you did struggle with this game and learning it and trying to understand it just from the rule book that was provided and it left a bad taste in your mouth and maybe you left a low rating on BGG, well hopefully after you get to this video you can understand it a bit better. I believe a rule book's been uh, updated and published already too so hopefully that's helped you uh, a bit. But This video is meant to be an addendum to that so you can really understand how it's played and really enjoy it. Um, so please if you get something out of this video uh, please go back to the page uh, for this game on BGG and, and upgrade your rating if you find that it is a better play now you understand it a little bit better so with that said let's grab those cards let's set up those scenarios and let's get on the march the main goal of free at last is to complete projects the scenario version of the game is one when the amount of projects completed are equal to the number of players plus one in this three-player game we'll go through, that means we'll need to collectively complete four projects. These projects are represented by the project cards, which give the project name and the state it takes place in along the top. The text in the middle shows the names of local figures that can help or hinder an organization's attempt to complete the project. Their effects are based on the strategy cards that are committed to the project, which you'll see shortly. You'll also notice an S a or V in the background of that text, telling you which type of project it is. S is for school desegregation, A for accommodation, and V for securing voting rights. The type is important as you'll see when we go through the gameplay. Below that section you'll see the number of resistance cubes which will need to be removed in order to successfully complete the project. In some cases, there are stages where different amounts of cubes are needed to be removed by the organization. I'll show you how that works as we go through the gameplay, but for now, let's talk about those cubes. Red cubes are commitment cubes, which you as players will be placing on the projects. The white cubes represent social resistance, depicting the local anti-black sentiment from the citizens that are fighting back against civil rights. The blue cubes are systemic resistance, depicting law enforcement and other institutions that are upholding white supremacy in the face of equality. Social and systemic are referred to together as seg cubes, short for segregation, but when they need to be referred to individually as social and systemic, I'll make that distinction. 
You'll see how these cubes work on the projects shortly. Each round, players will be dealt strategy cards, which will be used to bolster their commitment to the project they're taking on, or will be used for the ability, which is the text below. Players will get a chance to use the cards for their ability throughout the game rounds, on their project, or on another player's project. Each player will take on the role of an organization. The SNCC, commonly known as SNCC, CORE, SCLC, or NAACP. For the more advanced five and six player games, there are two other factions that can be used, the LDF and the LIBS, but this tutorial will focus on the two to four player game. Each organization comes with leaders who are represented by these tokens. They are either ready, in reserve, tired, or actively involved in a project. As you'll see, when they are assigned to a project, they must meet certain criteria of the project or the strategy cards being committed to that project, and in doing so, offer certain bonuses. Each organization has their specific organization card that can be used as the wild card with their strategy cards, or that card can be flipped face down on the player mat to show that they're using their org's special ability for the round instead. Organizations can do one or the other. Use the card or the ability, not both. Now I'll take you through the scenario mode and we'll show you how to play strictly cooperatively as well as competitively, which also highly depends on player cooperation. To start, look at the scenario page. We'll do scenario three, which asks us to select project cards 13 through 18, any five legislation cards, and challenge cards 10 through 25. Quick note, the challenge cards aren't numbered, that's another error in the first printing, but there should be an addendum doc out shortly, if not already, that gives the specific names of each card to be used in the scenarios. Take the strategy cards, shuffle them up to make the strategy draw deck. Then each player selects an organization, not using the libs or LDF as they're reserved for just the five and six player games. Know that turn order will always be SNCC, CORE, SCLC, and NAACP. In this three-player game, we'll use SNCC, CORE, and NAACP. Since we're using scenario mode, all players will take their leader tokens, and from that pile, select six they'll use for the game. The NAACP, however, they'll be able to use six leader tokens that say all on them, on top of the six that they select. SNCC and CORE will take three of those leaders and put them in the ready section on their mat, and the other three will go in reserve. NAACP will do the same, and the all leaders can all be set to ready. I'll reference the board, but note that I'll just be using it mostly for some of the tracks, not the map itself. Place the markers on the golden number spots for the commitment, social, and systemic resistance dice tracks. For competitive play, each player will take one of their button tokens and place them near the cube and impact tracks. You'll see how those work when we get to the competitive scoring throughout the rounds. Gameplay in Free at Last consists of rounds. These rounds are broken up into five phases. In each phase, players will take their turns. In one phase in particular, the direct action phase where players are actually trying to make progress on their selected projects. There's also stages that may dictate how long that phase lasts, so in some phases there can be a lot going on. Hang in there, I'll take you through them all, starting with the project phase. At the beginning of each round is the project phase, where players will select their projects that they'll be committing their organizations to. Start by revealing project cards equal to the number of players plus one. In our three-player game, that will be four project cards to start. Next, in turn order, starting with SNCC, then CORE, then SCLC, then NAACP, players will select the project they're going to work on. This may be tough to choose from in the first turn as no one has seen their strategy cards yet, so you might be making decisions based on the three leaders that you have ready, or that one more in the year reserve that you're going to be able to make ready soon in this phase. But don't worry, even if you can't complete the project this round, you may be able to carry it over to the next. So based on what you see, select your project. Since there will be one more project than players, put the unselected project back into the project card pile. It may be selected on a later round. The next step in this phase would be to hold a fundraiser. But in order to do that, you'll need cards in your hand. As no players have cards in hands on the first round of this phase, we'll skip that and come back to it later. Then you'll get to ready leaders, which includes taking a leader from reserve and placing them in ready. So now you'll have four leaders ready. 
you also get to move a tired leader to reserve but there's no tired leaders yet so we'll save that for next round as well and finally players will be dealt up to six cards each if this were a later round any cards already in hand for each player would count to that limit of six in this first round everyone will get dealt six cards to start now we move on to the commitment and resistance phase since you got the strategy cards in your hands, players can choose at least two cards to commit to the projects they selected in the previous phase. Each card selected will place three commitment cubes on that project, and the more the better. The type of project will require a special combination of strategy cards based on their color and rank. S projects will require two or more cards in sequential order, like 1, 2, 3, or 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 2, 3. A projects require two or more of the same color, red, white, or blue. And V projects require two or more of the same rank, all ones, all twos, all threes, or all fours. And remember, each organization has their special organization card that can be used wild if their org special ability isn't being used that round. So even if you only had one card you could commit to the project, Adding the organization card would at least give you the minimum two, but ideally you want to get three or four cards out to their start. Committing four cards would then get you 12 commitment cubes on that project, which is a really good way to start off. Pay attention to the local figures on the cards. They may help or hinder you in the next phase, depending on what type of cards are committed to the project. You'll see those effects later. Next, assign one of the ready leaders to the project. They must meet the requirements of the project, which may be the project state location type of project or the project description such as sit-in, or the color of the cards committed. For example, James Foreman can be selected for a project where the SNCC commits any blue cards. Elton Cox can go to A projects for the core, and Medgar Evans for the NAACP can go on any project set in Mississippi. Notice that many of the NAACP leaders have multiple options, and those marked with all, meaning they can go on to other org's projects. So if any of the other org is somehow left in the lurch without a leader to match the project they're taking on, they can get one of those NAACP eager leaders involved in the project. Note that you can only assign as many leaders to the project as there are stages on the project, with the exception of the SNCC, who has that special ability. But again, that's if their org card isn't going to be used as part of the commitment set of cards. When assigning the leaders, if any of them have a red cube with a number on it, add that number of commitment cubes to the project. All the other leader abilities will come into effect in the following steps and phases. But now comes resistance. Place the proper number of systemic and social resistant cubes as indicated on the card. Be sure to separate them out in groups that show what stage they're part of, if there are more than one stage on that project, for reasons that'll be clear later. Then roll the white and blue dice. For the numbers that appear on the respective dice, those cubes will be added to the project belonging to the acting player or to other players' projects. But first off, be sure to check the leaders assigned to the project and the project's local figures. If any of the conditions as noted by the local figures are met in the cards committed to the project, they may modify the dice roll. For example, on the Memphis Readins project, Mayor Henry Loeb would have you roll two dice instead of just the blue die and take the higher value to add blue systemic resistance cubes if three or less cards were committed to the project. On University of Georgia desegregation, if you commit four or more cards, you'll roll two die and take the lower value to add white social resistance cubes. But if you played a white card as part of the committed set of cards, Roy V. Harris would make you add an extra systemic and social cube. How the cubes get placed is very important. Blue systemic resistance cubes are divided between any of the chosen projects with at least one cube going to the current player's project so it can be spread out across the other players' projects. White social resistance cubes go on the current project but are divided between the stages any way the current player chooses. If an X is rolled, the number that the respective tracks are on for the dice will dictate the number of cubes added. If a K is rolled on the white die, then all leaders on the project are instantly removed, 
and they're set to the tired spot on that org's playmat. If there was already a tired leader on that org's playmat, they are removed from the game. Once the committed and resistance cubes have been placed on for one player's project, move on to the next player, do the same. They commit cards, add commitment cubes based on any modifiers, add leaders, their modifiers, then roll the blue and white die to see how many seg cubes get added. Once all players have finished the commitment and resistance phase, it's time to move on to the challenge phase if you've chosen to include that. Reveal two challenge cards to see their ongoing effects, which may impact you right away or may just impact you in future commitment phases or other rounds. After that, we move on to the meat of the game, which is the direct action phase. This is the portion of the game where players will attempt to remove first social, then systemic resistance cubes from their project before a reprisal could potentially happen to remove their commitment cubes. The first step, however, is the mutual aid step. Starting with the SNCC and going in order, other orgs can commit no more than one strategy card to that acting player's project. This means playing a card that would contribute more commitment cubes to that project. Again, not playing it for its event text. So, for example, if there's already all blue cards on an A project, another player can add another blue card for three more cubes. Or if it's the sequence that's been started, they can continue that sequence on an S project. Just note that the sequences must be completed before another one is started. At most, other players can contribute just one card on this turn of the mutual aid step. Once that is done, move on to the We Shall Overcome step, where the red commitment die is rolled and any modifiers applied dictate how many social resistance and then systemic resistance cubes are collected from that stage. Once rolled, check for any leader abilities, local figure modifiers, or any rounds after the first one where there might be a legislation modifier that could affect the die roll. For example, the leader James Foreman if he's joined the project, he adds plus two to the die roll. On the projects themselves, looking at Rock Hill sit-ins, for example, the Friendship 9 are the local figures. If a white card had been committed to the project, that adds plus two to the die roll as well. On Memphis Readings, the Lee Sisters allows you to roll two die for commitment and take the highest value. But some local figures might affect the commitment die roll negatively. For example, on the East Carroll Parish voter registration, Cecil Manning is the bad guy, and he would have you roll two die and take the lesser value if you had a one or two card of any color committed to that project. So, once all those modifiers have been applied, the acting player collects that many seg cubes, starting with the white social cubes before moving to blue systemic cubes on that stage, putting them on or by their player mat. Treat an X as the value that the level the commitment track is at for that die. It's important for that acting player to collect the cubes, keep them on their play mat, not putting them back in the supply just yet. Only collect the cubes for the current stage. And if the player would collect more than are on that stage, that player draws an additional strategy card for each cube greater than the number that was able to be collected. Then starting with the player and going in turn order, players may play strategy cards for the event text only if it would affect the current project or all projects collectively or have an ongoing beneficial effect for all players. Thus, the seg cubes could be reduced further on that project. Paying attention to whether the card's text says remove rather than collect. Whoever is playing the card that says collect gets to collect those cubes even if it's not their project. Once the cards are played, then we move on to the reprisal step but check to see if there are any seg cubes left on that stage of the project. If not, the stage is cleared, and if there are no other stages with seg cubes, then the project is completed. That org that's working the project, they take a freedom marker, move on to the next org's selected project as they'll begin their direct action phase. When playing competitively, for every commitment cube left on that project that's been completed, move your marker up the commitment tracker. But if there are still seg cubes left on that stage, remove that many commitment cubes equal to the cubes remaining. If that removes the final commitment cube on the project, the project is a failure, and the org has to collect a failure token. 
but otherwise if there's still commitment cubes in any combination of seg cubes for the current stage pass it over to the next org they'll do their direct action phase but as everyone goes through the turn it'll come back around to that player that still has seg cubes on the current stage and that org must attempt to remove more blue and white cubes from the current stage by rolling the commitment die the leader and local figure effects won't be triggered again this round so there's no modifiers beyond the die roll if however on that turn the org was successful at removing all seg cubes for that stage and there's another stage left with cubes on it they can choose to continue on the next stage once the direct action phase turn comes back to them if they pass when it comes back to their turn then they'll just move on to the next phase which is the recovery phase so the player shouldn't start a new stage if they're concerned about whether their commitment cubes will remove enough seg cubes in that stage and since the leaders they assigned and the local figures on the project won't have their abilities triggered anymore this round but they will trigger again at the start of the next round if the project doesn't get completed so it might be worth it to pass and hold out for reinforcements that will come for the next round if you're playing competitively if you've cleared a stage or committed a project count the number of social and systemic cubes you've collected and move your orgs marker up that respective track this will dictate scoring at the end of the round in the recovery phase. So to recap, after the mutual aid step where other players can commit a card to the active player's project, each org will take at least one turn removing seg cubes by rolling the red commitment die and applying modifiers. Then in turn order, players take turns playing strategy cards for the event techs if they choose to help that project or the entire team. After that, if there's any seg cubes left, then reprisal happens, then move on to the next player. This continues in player order until each project is completed, is failed, or the stage is cleared and the player chooses to pass rather than continue to the next stage. Once everyone is done or passed, it's time to move on to the recovery phase. Start by checking loss and victory conditions. If any one player has now collected three failure tokens, or if two failure tokens were earned collectively across the whole team in that round, the game is lost. The needle doesn't budge on civil rights in the southern United States, at least not for now. However, if the players have collectively completed the number of projects equal to the number of players plus one, the game has been won. If playing competitively, move on to the scoring phase. Otherwise, begin the cleanup. Remove all cards that were committed to a project that was completed or failed. Strategy cards, the strategy discard pile, and organization cards go back to that respective org's player mat. Discard challenge cards if they are meant to be discarded now, and any leaders that were on projects that aren't continuing to the next round, they're now placed in the org's tired pile face down. Any projects that are still ongoing, their cards and leaders stay in place. Now it's time to adjust the die tracks for the commitment, social, and systemic resistance. For every project that was completed and still had four or more commitment cubes on it, move the commitment track marker one space to the right. For every project that failed, move it one space to the left. For every project that was not completed but did not fail, move the systemic resistance track one space to the right. If all players completed their projects this round, move it a space to the left. For every project not yet completed that's still on the board, move the social resistance track one space to the right. For every completed project, move that one to the left. If you're playing in competitive mode, now it's time to look at the respective cube tracks for scoring. Starting with the SNCC player, they get one point on the impact track for each org they've surpassed on those cube tracks. Orgs that are tied on those tracks don't count as having surpassed each other. For example, on the commitment track, SNCC is at 6, NAACP at 4, CORE is at 0. Thus, SNCC would score 2, NAACP would score 1, and nothing to score for the CORE. On the social track, SNCC and CORE both have 4, NAACP has 2. So SNCC and CORE will both score 1, nothing for the NAACP. And finally, legislation takes place. Flip over two of the legislation cards and the players must collectively pass one. They will need to decide amongst themselves which to pass based on the ongoing effect which will benefit them in later rounds. In order to pass the legislation, 
Players must collectively contribute the freedom markers they earn by completing projects or through other card actions. Cost to pass each legislation is one freedom marker plus one for each legislation that's already been passed. So in the first round, that'll just cost one. Then on to round two, where you'll reveal one project for each project that was completed in the previous round plus one. Any player not actively working on a project that's carried over from the last round will get to select a new project. And this time they may have cards in hand so that can help decide which project to select. On this round and following rounds, do the same and then move on to Fundraiser. Going in turn order, if any player has a strategy card labeled Fundraiser, they can use it to help another player's org. Players can only offer one Fundraiser per round and can only accept one per round. Then prepare your leaders, moving one from reserve to ready and flipping one over from tired to reserve in that order. Deal every player's strategy cards to fill their hand up to six and proceed to the next phases. Remember to take into account the challenge cards that were revealed last round. They may have some lingering effects. And also that the leaders that are still on active projects will be able to use their special abilities once more this round as will the local figures on those projects. And also take into account that the legislation you passed last round and how it may help you with your projects moving forward. In the commitment phase, if there were projects carrying over from the last round, cards may be added to increase the number of commitment cubes, as long as they're still matching or in sequence with the cards already there. There's also going to be a resistance die roll, even if they are projects carrying over from the last round, that's going to add more seg cubes to that project. Play continues in this way until you collectively hit your loss or victory conditions for the game. If you as a team have managed to pass projects equal to the number of players plus one and you're playing competitively, then look at the final score on the impact track to see which organization comes out on top. This is the org that's had the biggest impact on the civil rights movement. The narrative, although this is a mass effort for civil rights that had thousands of contributors in the forms of leaders, activists, and volunteers, there were some competing schools of thoughts on how true freedom could be achieved. So this is why I say it's really more engaging to play in that competitive mode. It's the facet of the game that makes it so unique. It shows, you know, how complex the situation was with all these different organizations with ultimately the same goal but different means to get to that goal. Um, they weren't necessarily competing but there were certain reasons why they made certain decisions. You're not going to see a very modeled historical outcome in this game but I think putting the agency on the players to say hey I'm working on this project I'm committed to this project I need to see it through for the good of the civil rights movement and I know they could use my help over there but I got to work on what I'm working on first. So it's a little bit of, uh, you know, help my brothers and sisters out where I can, but I got to make sure I stay focused on what I'm doing too. The wise man, a quote off the top of the video, is a household name. Everyone knows who Martin Luther King was, but he wasn't the only one leading the civil rights movement at the time. You might not know that from the brief history lessons you get in school. I know I didn't really learn that, at least in, in Canadian schools anyway. Uh, just like there's no one person leading the movement, and there's no one single march that made a difference, no one single sit-in or freedom ride that changed minds. It was collectively all these actions that ultimately moved the needle for equal rights. And never forget, that needle is still moving and still has a long way to go today. As I said off the top, there's absolutely an engaging and enlightening experience in this box. Once you get past the hurdles that are the initial rule book, you and your friends can absolutely enjoy and learn from the experience on the table. I'd like to make a note of a few things that I think would make the gameplay even better. First off, the map, the reason I didn't use it is in the rule book it says, hey, lay it out so that um, when you're playing your projects, um, when they're being selected, put them in the state that they belong to. Thing is, those cards don't necessarily fit in the states, and as neat as it would be to like have those cubes all lined up on the map, it's not really necessary. The map doesn't serve a purpose for any adjacency of one state to the next in movement or anything like that. So, if anything, I think it's a little detrimental to the message. Um, this idea that, hey, these southern states is where the problem with racism really was. No doubt there was some heavily entrenched white supremacy and systemic hurdles uh, to, to black Americans at the 
at the time and even still beyond but hey they didn't have a monopoly on racism and white supremacy let's just be clear about that that's where a lot of these projects happen but hey it's it's still widespread today and it's not just in the south right so really this is primarily it's a card game the focus should absolutely be on the cards and not the board itself uh, if anything maybe instead of that board the player boards could have been made with the, the same material a bit thicker a bit more durable you could have individual boards with the tracks for the different you know cube tracking uh, and points tracking overall and if you were playing the campaign mode or doing the march on washington that could be a separate thing because otherwise unless you're doing campaign that's you're not really using that section of the board and the strategy cards too i think they look great for the most part uh, they're mostly played for the events after the direct action phase but there's a lot of other times you could play them throughout the game it might seem a little out of sequence with the play so i think it would be really handy to have on the cards themselves to show which phase that they are going to show up in for example the project selection phase there's a few cards there uh, the commitment phase and even direct action and, and uh, legislation phases things like that so having a little icon or a little marker just a little initial of like hey this is the phase where you're going to use this card so at a glance without having to read all the text you know do i keep this or do i play it now uh, right away or do i just use it for a commitment um, and get the cubes on that project i think that would help with the cards themselves and the leader tokens too, they can make maybe be made a bit easier to read the names of the very important individuals that were uh, on those, uh, part of those organizations and on those projects. Um, you got black on kind of dark colored text, so it's kind of hard to read and see, and maybe the icons made a little bit bigger. One of the leaders named uh, on the tokens is Stokely Carmichael. He changed his name later to Kwame Ture. So, I'm not sure the decision to use his old name. He changed his name uh, later in life, uh, not long after the civil rights movement. So um, interesting choice. So I guess historically you want to reference hey, that was his name at the time and the name you would have seen uh, in the news, if uh, anything. But uh, yeah, just an interesting little choice there. A couple minor quibbles beyond the rule book, but the rule book is essentially the, the main hurdle of the package as it's delivered today. Uh, it's already been updated and hopefully that will help. And I uh, can't wait to see further development on this game, maybe a second edition down the road. So I will say, though, playing this game, I have learned a lot. There's not a lot I knew about the civil rights movement in the United States in the 60s. Um, I've learned more and more names of the people and the organizations involved. Like, I didn't know which specific org off the top of my head that Martin Luther King Jr. was heavily involved with. Uh, some of the other names of people that I would have known through the movement, well, half of them were actors. We have Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte who are in there. Um, those are some of the more household names, the names that I recognize anyway. So it's cool to see them show up, but there's so many other people, unsung heroes, uh, that whose names should really be uh, remembered and understood and the impact that they had on the civil rights movement. Since diving into this game, I've watched uh, a PBS doc called Freedom Summer. It's about Mississippi in 1964. Uh, really learning a lot from that too, but it's great to see the names and faces from the game that show up in this documentary and uh, where they all were and how they participated specifically in Mississippi. The only connection I have had to that Freedom Summer otherwise was the movie Mississippi Burning, which um, a heck of a flick, absolutely. Um, I remember watching that many years ago, probably a little bit of white saviorism going on in that. So it's great to see you know, the people involved in their stories, uh, this documentary and in the game itself. I hope this video clears things up for you might not serve as the best reference doc, but I'll make the script available for anyone that wants it if they want to read through just for some uh, reference points, but uh, you know, jump back and forth through the video uh, as you need to. Um, that said, this is a great game. Please dive into it, appreciate it, uh, give it a fair chance. Um, I really hope you can enjoy it as much as I have. So happy gaming. Hope to see you at the table someday. Cheers.